Our next speaker is Jeff Bailey, who has also flown over from uh, New York. He's from Brooklyn. Uh, he's a member of the International Socialist Organization and a filmmaker, I'm told. Um, and he's also an editor and contributor of the International Socialist Review. So make him welcome. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit. Bhaskar did a good job of summing up kind of the last two years um, in the United States. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the resistance and the politics and some of the debates um, within building a resistance. But I did just want to start off by saying a couple other things about um, the last two years generally, which in the U.S. have felt like uh, a combination of political whiplash um, and extreme polarization. I mean, we have seen clearly the growth of the right at every level, at the level of Washington and, and policy. It has been a dizzying two years where each assault feels more extreme and more ludicrous and more beyond the bounds of what we thought was possible than the last one, um, as well as the growth of a, a terrifying far right um, that we saw on disgusting display in Charlottesville um, and that we'll talk more about uh, tonight and how to fight it. But it is worth remembering that within that, at every turn, Trump has been met not only with the kind of um, you know, the, the resistance that takes place in dinner parties and in bars and cafes where there's just a hatred of the man at every level um, of society, but also on the streets, uh, beginning with the airport protests um, when he initially proposed his ban on Muslim immigration, which was one of the most inspiring protests I've ever been a part of, um, completely spontaneous. I had friends that I never knew were political calling me on the phone or being like, are you at JFK yet? Um, and the running joke was that it was the one time in New York that New Yorkers actually enjoyed going to JFK uh, <laughs> airport. Um, but thousands of people turned out for that. The taxi workers uh, went on strike and refused to pick up passengers from JFK in solidarity with the protests. Um, and that culminated in the women's marches, the largest single protest um, in, in US history. Um, and since then, we've seen continued, continuing efforts to, to resist um, Trump's agenda, and not just Trump, but the wider Trumpism that, that Bhaskar talked about, um, and often in the unlikeliest of places. Last summer, uh, pro football games for weeks became the center of anti-racist uh, anti protests as both players took a knee on the field and then people protested um, in the stands and outside the stadiums. And most recently, a movement that began in Hollywood, not necessarily the bastion of radical leftism, but beginning with the, the horrific allegations of against Harvey Weinstein really exploding into a much wider movement around Me Too that then reaches into workplaces uh, really around the country. Um, but as Bhaskar said, it was very difficult because of the weakness of official opposition on the one hand, and then the small size of the left um, and the newness of many of these movements to, to cohere them and to consolidate them around a movement that could build from one to the next. So 2017 felt like we had these great flare-ups, but quite sporadic um, and difficult to sustain. So 2017, at least in my mind, felt like it ended as kind of a stalemate. You could watch Trump's approval ratings crumble to the lowest point of a US president at the time. In fact, you had to go back to Nixon just before the Watergate uh, scandal to find approval ratings that low, or the final season of Celebrity Apprentice. Um, <laughs> but it also felt like we hadn't seen that kind of sustained resistance that could turn the tide and push him back. Um, I was actually reading an article uh, last week that there was a, a, a noticeable spike in alcohol sales in the US over the holidays. <laughs> Um, as people went back to kind of nurse their wounds um, or, or to deal with families that supported Trump and had to kind of gird yourself with a stiff drink. Um, at the level of formal politics in Washington, um, the resistance, the so-called resistance of the Democrats has been um, particularly spineless. Um, and it's true, right after the election there were debates um, in the Democratic Party about what went wrong and whether a new strategy was needed. Um, there were two sides to that debate. One was the people around Hillary Clinton who said, we want to continue to focus on social issues while we continue to support neoliberal economic policies. We're not going to actually pursue policies to you know, fight oppression, but we'll, we'll speak to those issues. And then another wing that said, no, what we need is an economic message. But I think it's also worth saying that many of the people, 
like Schumer, who was saying we were needing an economic message tied to that, was also the idea that the Democratic Party had to tack right on social issues. We shouldn't be talking about trans rights. We shouldn't be talking about bathrooms. We should be talking, you know, we shouldn't be so hard on gun control. There was also um, an argument for a shift to the right. I think in recent months, you can actually feel a sigh of relief among the, Democrat, the establishment Democrats saying, maybe we don't have to stand for anything. <laughs> um, and in fact, there was an article uh, a few months ago that said it was called The Case for the Generic Democrat. And they were writing about, and they were serious, that wasn't a joke. Um, they were writing about the special election that took place uh, in Alabama where Doug Jones um, won. And <laughs> I'm going to sit down for this. And they said, um, they described his campaign. They said, the Senate's newest member did not embrace single payer health care, free, uh, free college, or a $15 minimum wage. He also didn't swerve right on abortion and guns. In fact, he didn't have any signature policy proposals at all. <laughs> what Jones did was take off the shelf the most pallid democratic talking points. Quality affordable health care. College must be affordable. I believe in science. <laughs> and campaigned with a pleasant, inoffensive demeanor. And that increasingly seems to be the strategy of the Democrats. Say you're opposed to Trump, say you're not Trump, but don't stand for anything. Um, and the, the argument in favor of that is that in the elections in 2018, the Democrats will be competing in um, largely conservative districts or red districts. Um, and I think this really is the singular importance of the strike in West Virginia and the recent walkouts in Oklahoma and the potential strike um, in, in Arizona and Oklahoma. Um, on the one hand, it showed the power of labor. And we know that is crucial importance to reviving a left in the United States. It also showed a different model of how a labor resistance could be built, one that's based among rank and file workers, one that's bottom up, democratic, um, and seeks to empower and organize workers from below. Um, but it also showed the profound changes that take, can take place in the midst of struggle um, that many of the areas that are talked about as Trump country also have a different history, particularly in West Virginia, which has a long history of mine struggles, union struggles that date back 100 years, but also just as recent as very militant struggles in the 1980s. Um, and I just wanted to, one of our members went down to West Virginia um, and interviewed teachers, and one of the teachers he interviewed was a, a librarian who described her transformation in the strike. Um, she had actually started as a Republican, and she talked about, bef before the strike, she talked about what it was that changed the way she thought about the world, um, and what became what she describes as a snowball. She said, what actually changed my ideas, and what really solidified it for me, was that my neighbor was gay. And when I watched the Republicans at a nation national level and a local level try to take rights from him, I said that I can't follow a party anymore that says he doesn't deserve the same rights that I have. That changed me. And from then on, it was just like a snowball. You start looking around you and seeing that there's so many people who need the protection of the Constitution. And I just don't feel like the Republicans were for that. And the strike then gave her an outlet for that to say how ordinary people could come together to fight for a better, uh, a better life. And that gives, I think, an indication of what an alternative could look like that could appeal to working class people across the country. Because the reality is in the United States that the average income um, for most American workers is the same as it was in 1973. And as I said last night, that's two generations of people who have watched the lives of their children get worse uh, than it was for their parents. With all of the other um, social, uh, social ills that come with that, not just the, the, the choosing between health care and education uh, for your children, but the op opioid epidemic. Um, and the healthcare crisis that we've seen in our country. The reality is, is that the silent majority in America are not the people who voted for Trump, who tended to be older, whiter, and wealthier uh, than most Americans in a country that's getting younger, poorer, and browner. And you can see, even in West Virginia, West Virginia was one of the uh, states that Sanders won the Democratic primary in. You can see the opening that could exist for a class-based um, left alternative. And as, as Bhaskar said, recent polls have Sanders uh, rated as the highest 
the most popular American politician, which is, by all accounts, a very low bar. But Sanders um, is most popular by high, and actually, um, in particular, among young people um, and blacks and Latinos, which is a bit of a shift from the elections where um, his support was underrepresented among blacks and Latinos. Um, that's been um, a, a bit of a shift. But as Bhaskar said, I think Sanders has played a contradictory role since the elections. Um, on some things he's spoken out well. He was one of the only politicians um, during the health care debate who put forward any kind of alternative of what an alternative to Obamacare would look like, what a single payer uh, program could look like, how it could be funded, um, and how it could be won. But increasingly, he hasn't played the same kind of agitational, oppositional role, but his campaign for Democrats um, and has, has made, seems, seemingly has made some peace with um, the, the structures of the party. We'll see if that changes, if he runs for 2020, but I think it, it, it has changed the landscape a little bit and pointed to the fact that the left needs its own vision. It needs its own structures. It needs its own ability to organize and put forward um, an alternative. And I think there's a few key issues that the left is going to have to grapple with and take up and, and, and be able to put forward. One is the ability to combine and show how issues of class and economics um, and bread and butter issues can be combined and strengthened by a focus against oppression. Um, that those two things cannot in the United States be divided, but a, a movement that's going to put forward uh, 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 a program to improve the lives of most Americans um, also needs to take up issues of police brutality, also needs to take up LBGTQ rights, and in a country w in which the working class is increasingly immigrant, needs to take up the issue of deportations um, and immigration. And increasingly, I think the left is going to have to put forward challenges to the arguments about nationalism and protectionism, which the left in the US, I think, as internationally, is quite um, weak on, um, sometimes even sliding into the same kind of China bashing uh, that we've seen from Trump. And in fact, one of the places where Sanders has consistently said he's willing to work with Trump is around protectionist issues. And the left needs to be able to put forward an alternative of internationalism um, and solidarity. Um, and increasingly, is going to be apt to take up the issue of combining the anti-war movement um, with, uh, with an alternative, particularly as uh, uh, Trump seems to be assembling a war cabinet um, around him. So I think part of the challenge is that increasingly, I think there's a, a focus on the 2018 elections and then the 2020 elections as the main way that we're going to resist Trump. But I think the experience of the last few months actually shows the opposite, that the times in which we've been able to push back against Trump and where we've been able to reframe the debate and discussion on the national level has been pre precisely when we've been able to organize social power when we've been able to organize around Me Too, um, even though Black Lives Matter has been less in the news um, in this past year with the killing of uh, a young man in Sacramento just this past week. There have been sit-ins and occupations in the state capitol there. Um, and of course, the uh, high school walkouts around gun violence these past weeks, and most importantly, the teacher strikes. So we have, at the moment, a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility you know, the, the, the numbers of people who supported Sanders, the number of people who looked to a socialist alternative um, is both daunting, but is a glimmer of hope and inspiration for the type of audience that exists for the left in the United States right now. And I think we have a, a, a dual challenge, which is we have an opportunity to win thousands of people in the, in the months and years ahead to a socialist alternative. We've seen the growth of DSA. We've seen the growth of other socialist groups, including my own. Um, it gives us an opportunity to build a socialist movement in the United States, but we also have a responsibility to use our joint weight, as, as Bhaskar was saying, to also try to rebuild the capacity and the organizations of people to fight back. There are millions of people who clearly, when they have a sense that they can fight Trump and that they can make a difference, will come out onto the streets and fight. We need to turn those people into organizers. We need to create spaces for people to meet and discuss and debate with one another so that we can turn one victory into a stronger movement the next time around and not feel like each time we're beginning uh, to start from scratch. So I think we need a, both a long-term strategy, the, the strategy of how do we rebuild the labor movement, how do we implant ourselves, what are the key industries, but we also need to be involved in the myriad of struggles, both at a local level and at a national level, that are building resistance to Trump today, because you can see the potential, but we still have a long way to go 
um, if we're gonna if we're gonna defeat him.